We good? All right, I want to say a special greeting to everyone watching online uh, now that the streaming is going. Uh, as I stated earlier, we're streaming on uh, four different platforms uh, provided by the church here. We're also going to be streaming on the Southwest Radio Ministries Facebook page and on the swrc.com website. Uh, Edward's going to help make that happen. And so we're going to be reaching uh, potentially quite a few folks. And also to the folks here, thank you for making time. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it very, very much. Our first speaker today is uh, uh, the executive producer of a ministry that we have at Southwest Radio Ministries called Marginal Mysteries. And you might say, well, that kind of sounds weird. Well, it fits perfectly because Micah's a little weird, so it's okay. I'm kidding. I kid because it's true. Um, no, it is a very unique outreach that uh, that he heads up, and I'll let him tell you all about it. And he has two very fascinating presentations he's going to be giving during the conference. Uh, the first one uh, this morning is called Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them. And I think that you will be completely fascinated and probably learn a few things this morning uh, with this absolutely outstanding presentation. Would you please welcome Micah Van Hus. Spacebar. How's everybody doing today? Doing, doing good. Let me turn this mic right here on. And we will use this one most of the time. So, um, I'm Micah Van Hus, and I uh, host Marginal Mysteries uh, for Southwest Radio Church. I want to start today by thanking any veterans we have. We have any veterans in here? What branch did you serve in, sir? Navy. Yes, a sailor. Well, I served in the, in the Marine Corps, and so uh, I served with many good sailors, so I appreciate your service. Yes, sir, absolutely. And we got, what back there, sir? Air Force. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service in the, in the Air Force. Uh, so today, uh, we are going to be talking about ancient cities. Uh, and the gods who built them. And tomorrow we will be talking about The Earth As It Was, uh, which is my presentation and a new book that I finished last week about uh, my speculation about the, how the earth was before the flood of Noah uh, and at creation. My next book, which I start on next month, will be Secret Societies. And I look forward to getting into that one. And it's going to be a lot of fun. <clears throat> So, uh, these are my social media uh, here at Marginal Mysteries, our social media links. Uh, in the room with all the books, I do have cards with all these links on there, YouTube, Facebook, all the different ones. So, feel free to pick up a card uh, if you want to follow Marginal Mysteries. What is your mountain view? When you look at the world, when you look at uh, the world from per the, what perspective do you look at it from? Well, I, I recommend and I argue that there should be one thing that you filter the entire world through, and that is simply... The Bible. <clears throat> it was at Pensacola Christian College uh, that I had got a real relationship with the Lord. Of course, we are only 30 minutes from Pensacola Christian College. Anybody have any family that went or uh, Pensacola Christian Academy? Um, actually, I guess we're about an hour away from Pensacola, aren't we? So, uh, yeah, I might go see some, some of my old friends over there um, this weekend while we're here. But uh, so um, I learned that just because a Christian says something or even a preacher says something, that does not mean that that's what God says in his word, that the Bible is my foundation for everything that I look at. So when you hear something, and I talk about a lot of mysteries, I do a lot of speculation, uh, when you hear anything from anybody, especially me right here in this presentation, you filter it through God's word. <clears throat> uh, the Bible is not just my Christian foundation, it's my foundation for my view of the entire world. Jesus Christ is the central point of history and the central point of the Bible, and it's imperative as we study the mysteries, study things on the side, that it's imperative that everybody comes to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It is what is the most important. So when we look at mysteries, we can look at them uh, as puzzle pieces, and some mysteries have more puzzle pieces 
than do others. Take, for instance, Jesus Christ. We know we actually have a lot of pieces about Jesus Christ because he is the central point of the Bible, the central point of history. So we know a lot of things about Jesus. There are some things we don't know. Did Jesus go to India and preach to those folks there uh, from the age of 12 to 29? Where was he? Was he in Egypt that whole time? Uh, what was Jesus doing? So we do have some missing pieces, but we do have a lot of information about Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of things in our universe and a lot of things in the Bible that we do not, uh, about which we do not have much information. How much do we know about the Garden of Eden? How much do we know about the Pharaoh of the Exodus? How much do we know about the Heavenly Council of Elohim? <clears throat> Why are so many of the ancient lesser gods depicted as human and animal hybrids? And why did God tell, man, to tell the animals to fear mankind after the flood of Noah? Why did Native Americans greet each other by showing their hands? Well, I'll tell you right here, it was to ensure that you didn't have giant's blood running in your veins. But bear with me, we'll get to that. <clears throat> there are many different places, many different things from which we can get our answers to the uh, puzzle pieces that are missing, such as artifacts, uh, old legends, um, all kinds of things, writings, uh, where we can get puzzle pieces to try to help fill in some of the things that are missing. Take, for instance, this right here is the famine stela. It is a rock in a swan Egypt on which is carved a story <clears throat> about a famine that took place in Egypt. So let me read a little bit of what's, what you're seeing on this rock right here. It says, I was in mourning on my throne. Those of the palace were in grief. My heart was in great affliction because Hopi, the river god, had failed to come in a time in a period of seven years. Grain was scant, kernels were dried up. Scarce was every kind of food, every man robbed his twin. Those who entered did not go out. Children cried, youngsters fell, the hearts of the old were grieving. Legs drawn up, they hugged the ground, their arms clasped about them. Courtiers were needy, temples were shut, shrines covered with dust, Everyone was in distress. Now, does this remind you of any stories that we read in the Bible? Exactly. This is uh, almost exactly what we read about in the story of Joseph, uh, who advised Pharaoh to store up grain for the seven years of plenty because seven years of famine were coming. Let's read in Genesis chapter 41. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. Now, in my book, Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them, uh, we will take a little bit deeper look into the similarities between Imhotep, who we find on the famine stela, and Joseph uh, in the Bible. Now, remember, because the Bible is my solid foundation, I look at the world through the lenses of the Bible, not the other way around. Let's get into our cities. Few cities has, have been as important to the history of the world as Rome because God controls the ebb and flow of mankind. Uh, he controlled uh, Rome, her military, her infrastructure, and we will take a, a look at Romans' spreading of Christianity throughout the world. Roman literary works have given us vast amounts of knowledge uh, about our ancient world. Uh, one of Rome's writers was Virgil, lived around 70 BC. He was a great poet of the early Roman Empire. He wrote the Inferno, a guide through the nine levels of hell. Virgil also wrote the epic Aeneid, which tells of Aeneas, a Trojan prince, who escaped the burning of Troy in the final days of the Trojan War to eventually make his way across the Mediterranean Sea to Latium, Italy. It's at Latium where Aeneas' descendants, Romulus and Remus, are said to have founded uh, the city of Rome, according to Roman mythology. Now, in the story of Aeneas, Virgil took inspiration from the biblical account of Abraham, because there are many similarities between what we read here about Aeneas and the story of Abraham. Let's take a look at some of those similarities. So in the Bible, Abraham delays in Haran, which later becomes Israel's enemy. Aeneas delays in Carthage, which later becomes Rome's enemy. Abraham finally reaches Canaan, out of which his descendants will rule other people. Aeneas' descendants reach Rome, out of, which will eventually rule the world. Now God tells Abraham, that 430 years will pass before his descendants inherit the promised land. Jupiter, who was a Roman god, tells Aeneas that 333 years will pass uh, before the foundation of the city of Rome. Birds of prey attack Abraham's carcass sacrifice in the Bible. Harpies, which are mythological bird women, attack Aeneas' feast. Jacob's wife, Rachel, takes her father's household gods, or his teraphim, in order to bring them to a new land. 
Now, bringing the household gods to Italy is the purpose of Aeneas' journey. Now, be, by show of hands, how many folks know what a teraphim is? Uh, someone who's heard me before back there. So, not only are the teraphim the mummified heads of people's ancestors, but they're the talking mummified heads of people's ancestors, and yes, they are in the Bible, and yes, they speak in the Bible. So bear with me, and we'll get to the scripture. So this right here is a picture from National Geographic, 1953. Uh, these teraphim were found at the city of Jericho. <clears throat> now, uh, in Gnohem, uh, Gnohem is a valley south of Jerusalem where evil people uh, were buried. Uh, in the chapters of Rabbi Eliezer, we read a description about the teraphim. What are the teraphim? They slay a man, a firstborn, and he is red in color. Everyone who follows that knowledge will ultimately go down to Gnohem. And they pinch off his head and salt it with salt and spices, and they write upon a golden plate the name of an unclean spirit and place it under his tongue, and they put it in the wall, they kindle lamps before it, and bow down to it, and it speaks to them. <clears throat> so here we see Gnohem, it's a valley south of Jerusalem where they bury the evil people. Well, Genesis chapter 31 is the first time in the Bible that we read about these teraphim. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. The word images here in Hebrew is ha teraphim, the teraphim. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, in that he told him not that he had fled. So Jacob has taken his wife Rachel, and he's run away from his father-in-law Laban. Uh, but before they left, Rachel stole her father's household gods, his teraphim. Now, why does she do that? Now, I speculate with what we're talking about that she was afraid that the teraphim would have told Laban where they had gone, so she took them. But let's continue reading the story, again in Genesis chapter 31, verse 34. Now, Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. So variances of the word haterephim are found 15 times in the Hebrew text. In Judges chapter 17, Micah has a house of gods, or teraphim. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, Michal, the wife of King David, soon to be King David, uh, she puts a teraphim in, his, in bed to deceive Saul's messengers that David was actually in the bed. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 29. Excuse me. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster, and cover it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And Saul sent messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. Now, an interesting side note from what we've just looked at, we have two wives of godly men who are in possession of these teraphim. Now, finally, let's get into the point in Scripture where the teraphim speak, and that is Zechariah chapter 10, verse 2. The word idols here is teraphim. For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie and told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Again, the Hebrew word for idol is teraphim. Now, to recap, we have found a mystery in the Bible. We found knowledge from writings, but also from the uh, artifacts, the heads that they found at Jericho, to try to help understand what's going on here uh, in Scripture when it talks about these teraphim. <clears throat> Again, there's the teraphim at Jericho. The second city that we will look at this morning is Mount Olympus. It is the mythological dwelling place of the ancient Greek gods, uh, the Olympians. Mount Olympus is a real place that you can visit today. It's located in northern Greece and is one of the most important places in Greek mythology. Now, our sources for what we know about Mount Olympus and Greek mythology are Homer's Iliad, Hesiod's Theogony, the works of the historian Herodotus, and geographers Pausanias and Strabo. Hesiod's Theogony recounts the Greek mythological version of creation. It tells of the Titanomachy, which was the war between the Titans and the Olympian gods. We read about the Greek god Zeus. Zeus had many female human lovers. One of those women was a Phoenician princess named Semil. Zeus's jealous wife Hera tricked Semil into asking Zeus to show her his full glory. After all, how could Semil know that Zeus was the most powerful god unless he would show her his whole glory? So Zeus knew that showing a mortal uh, his full glory would kill her, uh, but Semil insisted. So Zeus tries to show her just a little bit of his glory, but it still ends up killing uh, Semil, and she's incinerated by Zeus's thunderbolts. So why do I tell this story? Because in Scripture, we have a very interesting 
parallel. Someone in Scripture asked God if he can see his full glory. It was Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Verse 20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So this is very interesting here, uh, very similar to what we read about in the Greek mythological story of Zeus and Samuel. But Moses uh, cannot see God's glory, or else Moses will die from God's glory. But it's not the only mystery we see here. Also in this story, we see the illumination of human skin. Let's continue reading in Exodus 43. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, <clears throat> that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. <clears throat> Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. So this is a fascinating story about a human who spends time around the Holy Spirit. And after 40 days up here on the mountain, Moses' skin is literally shining. This is a story from the Bible. Very fascinating. Uh, it's not the only time we find it in the Bible. We'll get to there in just a second. Um, also, a little known fact since we're here, did you know that Moses broke all 10 of the commandments? <clears throat> In Exodus 32, 19, Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. So, yes. All right. Uh, another time in Scripture where human skin illuminates is Acts chapter 15, verse 15. We're talking about Stephen. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. <clears throat> also, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth him up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Now we are just hitting a chain of fascinating mysteries uh, here in Scripture because I'll take a minute to mention the high places. <clears throat> Notice that Jesus was transfigured on a high mountain apart. This is most likely Mount Hermon, since Jesus was mentioned as being in the area uh, at the time of Matthew chapter 17. Um, notice in Exodus that God meets with Moses on Mount Sinai. Ezekiel 28 says that Eden was upon the holy mountain of God. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 reads, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, it's not just the Bible that we read about these high places and spiritual things taking place on them. It's also the book of Enoch, uh, the watchers, the fallen angels, uh, they descended on Mount Hermon in the book of Enoch. It's almost as if the high places have a bit to do between uh, the movement between the spiritual and physical realm. Um, not something I've studied fully, but it's, it's just fascinating because here in Scripture we see so many times uh, that things spiritual are taking place on these high mountains. <clears throat> now, I've thrown a lot at you from uh, illuminated skin uh, to God's glory um, and the, the high places. Uh, I have a lot more to say about it, but not in today's presentation. Uh, it is all in my uh, first book, Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them. If you're interested in more looking into those topics a little deeper, uh, feel free to take a look at that. <clears throat> so um, this brings us uh, to uh, the topic of today's discussion, Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them. Now, who are these gods that I speculate that built the ancient cities? Well, I speculate that it is the Nephilim, the giants mentioned in the Bible, uh, that built these. Who were the Nephilim, the Watchers, and the Sons of God? Now, I won't beat around the bush. Um, I believe, uh, I will give you my succinct summary of who I believe that these beings were, and I will back up my theories with Scripture uh, here in just a moment. <clears throat> From my studies, I believe that the Watchers are the angels that God put around the earth at the time of his creation to watch over it. They are in the Hebrew text, the Beneha Elohim, in Genesis chapter 6, Jude chapter 1, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, they rebel against Elohim, they take on human form, they take wives from among human women, 
<clears throat> and their offspring are called the Nephilim. The Nephilim are the giants that we read about in Scripture. Now, why should we care about these things? Because I believe that everything that God puts in his word is worthy of taking a study. And also, I am fascinated uh, by the mysteries of the universe and the mysteries of the Bible. Also, Christ himself says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, this is Luke chapter 17. Christ also says to be ready for his return, that it comes as a thief in the night. Well, how can we be ready for the return of Christ if we don't know what it was like in the days of Noah? So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6, this is the chapter where we're introduced to Noah. Verse 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives, all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for also that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Uh, the hundred and twenty years here, I believe, uh, was the hundred and twenty years that God gave to mankind to repent before the flood. Um, it's in the apocryphal book of Jasher, but we do know that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so according to the book of Jasher, Noah and Methuselah, uh, his grandfather, they preached for 120 years. And God said, if mankind will repent, I will not send the flood. That is extra biblical. Uh, we don't find that specifically in the Bible. But I do believe that right here in verse 3, the 120 years does refer to that. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> and there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So also notice here in Genesis chapter 6, after the mention of the bloodline of the Bnei Elohim, that Noah's bloodline is mentioned four verses later. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Perfect in his generations. In other words, his bloodline had not become tainted with what we just read about four verses earlier with the Bnei Elohim breeding with human women and having giants. That's my speculation, uh, my take on it. <clears throat> so I will not put the book of Enoch on screen. I do not believe that the book of Enoch is inspired. Uh, though I do believe it's correct history after studying it uh, as much as I have. Um, but it will parallel what we're getting ready to read in the New Testament in 1 Peter and Jude and a couple of other places. So summarizing the book of Enoch, this part of the story, the flood has happened. The bodies of the Nephilim are dead. The watchers are cast, the angels uh, who took on human form are cast into the prison, cast into the abyss. And the book of Enoch calls it a, it names a place in a desert, but this is the antediluvian world. So not a place that we know today. The Nephilim uh, bodies are killed, but their spirits are on the earth. Because the Nephilim spirits are not fully angel, but also not fully human, they cannot be brought to heaven. Uh, and so according to the book of Enoch, which I don't put on screen here, the, all the evil spirits that we have on the world today are the spirits of the Nephilim, uh, the bodies that were killed. So um, anyway, the floods happen in the book of Enoch, and God tells his archangels to round up not only the watchers, he tells Uriel to go tell Noah uh, just before the flood, but he tells them to gather their spirits and cast them into the prison for 70 generations until the great day of judgment. Well, let's come back to Scripture and read about this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So here in 1 Peter chapter 3, Jesus Christ dies on the cross. His body is in the ground for three days. What 1 Peter chapter 3 says, his spirit, the first thing that the spirit of Jesus does after he dies on the cross is he goes down into the abyss and ministers to the spirits that made trouble in the days of Noah. Again, I do not believe the book of Enoch is inspired but I do believe it's correct history. And here in 1 Peter, we actually have backup for the story that we do read in the book of Enoch. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 says that the Nephilim won the earth after the flood as well. And here we will get to the Tower of Babel. The foundations of the Tower of Babel are said by some to have been found at Eridu. There is a tower foundation, a square tower foundation at Eridu. I do believe that the Tower of Babel wasn't necessarily a, ta a tower as much as it was a ziggurat, like a pyramid, um, not necessary to reach into heaven. Because scripture, we've always been told that the Tower of Babel was to reach God. It, scripture does not say it was to reach God. The purpose for the Tower of Babel was so that mankind would not be scattered across the earth. They were making a name for themselves. We'll read it in a second uh, so that they could make a name for themselves. In fact, let's read it. 
right now. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, and they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now notice that this is in direct disobedience to what God says two chapters earlier to Noah, to go throughout the world, be fruitful, and multiply. We read there in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. So after the separation at the Tower of Babel, God divides the world into 70, between 70 and 72 nations. This is the point in Scripture where God chooses Israel, chooses Abram, who will become Abraham, as his chosen people. Uh, what I do believe is that God gives the other 70 nations to the B'nai Elohim, to the angels to rule over. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance... When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So uh, verse 8, the number of the children of Israel is 70. Seventy descendants came with Jacob into Egypt uh, after um, Joseph uh, reveals himself as the second in command of Egypt. Seventy people come with Abraham. So the number of the children of Israel in Scripture is 70. And God divides the world into 70 nations. This is not the only point just here in Scripture, but we also have in mythological stories the story of Atlantis, the very first thing that the story of Atlantis says in, uh, in the Critias by Plato is that the gods divided the world among themselves. Uh, so we also see this in mythology, not just Scripture. Um, let's compare Scripture just a little bit right here in Deuteronomy 32a. In the Greek, uh, excuse me, the Masoretic text, which is where we get the King James, it does not say to whom God divides the nations. In the Greek Septuagint, God divides them to the Agalon Theo, which are the uh, angels of God, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, here at Deuteronomy 32, 8, uh, it says the Beneha Elohim, which are the watchers, the sons of God. Um, this is not, uh, I did a lot of studying in my brand new book that I finished last week that will be printed next week, The Earth as it was, the princes of the power of the air that we read about in the New Testament. We also read about these princes in the book of Daniel, and it's fascinating that these princes of the power of the air are in charge of nations. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, off the top, no, chapter 10, um, there is a prince of Persia that we read about where Michael the archangel battles the prince of Persia. And later in that chapter, it mentions the prince of Greece. Uh, a lot of uh, folks mistakenly think that Michael is the leader of God's armies. Michael is the prince of Israel, um, not necessarily the leader of God's armies. So, uh, you know, we're getting out of this uh, book's uh, specs a little bit, but the princes of the powers of the air that we war against in the New Testament, I believe, are these 70 angels or fallen angels that, the God, that God gives to rule over the 70 nations that we just read about in Deuteronomy chapter 32. But let's digress a little bit. I'll talk a bit about that tomorrow. Uh, what you're looking at here is the reshot structure. Um, you can go on Google Earth today, and this is in northwestern Africa. And as we mentioned in the story of Atlantis, the gods divided the world among themselves. I believe what we are looking at here at the reshot structure is the destroyed city of Atlantis. I do not believe the city of Atlantis is, uh, is lost. I believe this is it. Um, it is only the Disney movie that uh, describes or depicts Atlantis as being underwater. There's really the only place we see Atlantis underwater was under a foot of water after its destruction in, the, in, the, in Plato's writings. You cannot sail a boat to Atlantis because the mud is a foot underneath the water. You can see the grass sticking out of the water. Um, so uh, Atlantis was not buried in the ocean. I do believe that this is the destroyed city of Atlantis, and we get into the reshot structure uh, a lot uh, in the book, <clears throat> Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them. So uh, I do not believe uh, that the B'nai Ha Elohim that we read about in Gen Genesis chapter 6 were human. Uh, some will say that the B'nai Ha Elohim were the godly line of Seth, that they were human, and they will use Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, to back that up. They say, Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 says, For in the resurrection, we're talking about angels here, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Well, the angels that we are reading about in Genesis chapter 6 are not God's angels. They've rebelled against him, and they are no longer in heaven. They have decided to descend upon the earth and take on human form. So I do not agree that Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 disproves that. But I do believe that Jude chapter 1, which pretty much quotes from the book of Enoch, uh, in our New Testament, does confirm this. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, the idea of angels taking on human form uh, and even touching humans should not be foreign to us as Christians, because there's many points in Scripture where good angels take on human form and touch human beings. Genesis chapter 19, verse 15. 
And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, we're talking about Lot, while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So here in Genesis, we have angels grabbing Lot uh, by the hand. These are also the same angels who eat uh, with Abraham, I believe, and the Lord is one of the three angels mentioned with Abraham when they do eat in the desert. Uh, this is the time where uh, Sarah scoffs when God says that she will become pregnant at her age in the, in the 90s. Uh, she scoffs. So this is just before the story we just read about in Lot, where the angels are actually grabbing Lot by the hand. So the idea that angels taking on human form and touching people it should not be foreign to us. We read it in Scripture multiple times. So in Job chapter 2, uh, we read, verse 1, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. <clears throat> so first of all, notice here that the Bnei Elohim in Hebrew, the sons of God, they are meeting in heaven. So I do not believe that these are the human line of Seth. These are beings that are in heaven right here in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, but uh, let's take a little side note. I also do not believe that this is actually the capital Satan. The Hebrew word here for Satan is Hasatan. Uh, 27 times a version of Satan appears in the Old Testament. Hasatan, Usatan, uh, once it is actually Satan. Uh, but here it is Hasatan. So Hasatan is used in Scripture in multiple places to mean adversary or one who stands in the way of. Um, a lot of it's, it's easy to translate that into Satan, but because Satan's name means adversary, one who stands in the way of. Uh, so let's read in Scripture a couple places where Satan uh, does not mean the capital letter Satan. First uh, Samuel chapter 29, uh, And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him, and the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place, which thou hast appointed him, and let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary. The Hebrew word is lesatan, uh, for adversary here. And here the Philistines are talking about King David. King, the Philistines call King David lesatan, which um, it, it's the same Hebrew word as we read in Job chapter 1. So uh, here they translate it as adversary because they're talking about King David, obviously. Also, in Numbers chapter 22, verse 22, the angel of the Lord is called lesatan in the Hebrew. And the God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. So here's uh, two points in Scripture where Lesatan is, is translated separately. So what I believe is going on in Job chapter 2, uh, that it is not Satan that we're reading about that says, Hey, Job, have you considered Job? And God says, Have you considered Job? Uh, I do believe it's a watcher, an angel who has been put around the earth, and I think this specific watcher's job was to accuse rich people of loving their riches more than they love God. And so that is really, I believe, what is going on in Job chapter 2. Uh, the, God gives the watcher the authority to see if Job truly worships God. Now again, my speculation, um, but uh, I do believe that is correct. It is not, there's one spot in scripture where we do read about the watchers. Uh, I don't think it's in the slideshow, but Daniel chapter 10 or, or 12 Nope, Daniel chapter 4. There's three verses in Daniel chapter 4 where it mentions the watchers. Uh, Daniel sees a watcher and holy one from God coming down from heaven. Um, so um, let's get back to the Nephilim. According to the book of Enoch, the Nephilim taught forbidden knowledge to humankind. Here's a list in the book of Enoch of what the Nephilim taught to, to man. Charms, enchantments, the cutting of roots, plants, swords, knives, shields, breastplates, metallurgy, bracelets, ornaments, Metal mixing, makeup, the types of costly stones, herbalism, writing, spiritualism, abortion, astrology, constellations, meteorology, the signs of the earth, sun, and moon. Now, a lot of the ancient cultures will use the cubit as their form of measurement. The cubit would be the distance between the fingertip and the elbow. Uh, most ancient cultures use that as their measurement. So uh, on my studying, uh, I found this one on my own. There is actually a point in scripture that we read about technology that the angels taught to mankind, and that was the cubit. Let's read right here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 17. <clears throat> We're reading about uh, John's vision of heaven, and a man is using a rod to measure heaven. And in verse 17, it says, And he measured the wall thereof, and 144 cubits, according to the measurement of a man, that is, of the angel. So what we read about in the book of Enoch, of the watchers teaching forbidden knowledge, teaching all kinds of knowledge to innocent mankind before the flood, 
Here we have one point in the scripture that does back that up, and it says that the angels taught the cubit to mankind. So if anybody knows of any other instances in scripture, I'm happy to, happy to listen. <clears throat> so in Genesis chapter 9, we read that God told the animals to fear mankind after the flood. Verse 2, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Now, why did God tell the animals to fear mankind after the flood? The animals were innocent before the flood. They weren't as afraid, like you walk up to a wild animal, they'll run away. Whereas before the flood, I don't think that they did. Well, I speculate that their innocence before the flood made it easier for the Nephilim to corrupt the animals on the earth. In the book of Enoch, chapter 7, the Nephilim sinned against the animals. Uh, I speculate that they were mixing the DNA of animals, but also the DNA of humans and animals. Let's read in a scripture again, Genesis chapter 9, verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them from the earth. I believe that the Nephilim were not only mixing the DNA of animals, but they were also mixing the DNA of humans and animals. Why are so many of the ancient gods, from Egyptian to Greek to Norse, why are they half human, half animal? Why are they superpower humans? Well, I believe that the Nephilim were mixing. Um, <clears throat> a chimera is an organism containing a mixture of genetically different tissues formed by the process such as fusion of early embryos, grafting, and mutation. Uh, this may help to explain why so many of these ancient gods were human-animal hybrids. Um, let me jump off my notes real quick and jump from the presentation. Um, there was a lot of crazy technology going on, I believe, in the antediluvian world, which I speculate a lot more about in the book. But this is bonus. I've never given this one in this presentation. I actually believe that it is very likely that there was a nuclear war before the flood of Noah. Um, it's in my book, which isn't out there. I finished the book last week, and it'll be printed uh, next week. But... There is uh, ancient Hindu writings. The Rig Veda is one of the ancient Hindu writings. Uh, the, the names are very long and hard to, hard to pronounce. But the Rig Veda was written in 1500 BC. And the words that describe a nuclear weapon from 3,500 years ago is uncanny. The brightness of 10,000 suns, a metal arrow was shot into the sky, and the flesh on the men's faces melted as the explosion happened. Their armor melted on their skin. Women lost their babies in their womb and people were born with genetic mutations for 200 years after that happened. This was 3,000, the words that you read are 3,000 years old, 3,500 years old. Anyway, let's get, let's get away from that, but I do believe that there was something going on, uh, what technology did mankind have before the flood? Fascinating stuff, but that was, that was bonus. It wasn't really what I was talking about today. So, <clears throat> so uh, an interesting side note when we're talking about Noah getting off the ark, God tells Noah that mankind can now eat red meat. Before the flood, he gave evergreen herb, to every animal, including sharks and T-Rexes, he gave evergreen herb to man and animals. Now, sharks and T-Rexes, were they corrupted at the fall of man when thorns became? Were they corrupted by the Nephilim? Were they corrupted right here with God's new covenant with man? Uh, when did sharks and T-Rexes start eating meat? Uh, I don't know the answer, but we can speculate. Anyway, um, God tells mankind you can now eat red meat. Well, when you eat red meat, some of the iron from the meat stays in your body. And if you lived to be 900 years old, like Adam and the patriarchs before the flood, you would have died prematurely just from all the iron in your body. But now, after the flood, because mankind's years were roughly 120 and less, uh, we don't die from eating red meat. So that's a bonus note as well. <clears throat> so when we're talking about the Nephilim and the giants in the Bible, as a kid, I always wondered, why did God tell Joshua around the 13th century B.C. to kill not just the men, but also the women, the children, and the animals. Well, I believe that, every, in fact, I've, from reading, every instance where God tells Joshua to kill the women, children, and animals, they are a race of giants. In other words, what God was doing with wiping out the corruption at the flood with the giants, he was also doing with Joshua of the remnants of the Rephaim, the Anakim, and there's a few other um, races in there that were giants. Um, <clears throat> Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people uh, that we saw in, the, uh, in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, who's, who come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were 
in their sight. Now, another interesting thing, again, that gives the book of Enoch a little more credence, the book of Enoch says that when mankind could no longer satiate the giants, the Nephilim, the giants began to eat mankind and drink their blood. Well, right here in Scripture, Numbers 13, 32, it says, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. So this right here, Numbers chapter 13, is actually uh, giving more credence to the book of Enoch when it says the giants ate mankind. <clears throat> so why did the Native Americans uh, show their hands? Well, what did the Native Americans know about the giants? Well, the uh, book, The Old War Roots of the Cherokee, I'm from the Appalachian Mountains of Tennessee, and that's where the Cherokee uh, are from. Uh, this book, The Old War Roots of the Cherokee, reads... What kind of Indians lived in the ter ter territory of the Choctaw and the Chickasaw carved out for their new home? According to their traditions, as confirmed by excavations of bones in Tennessee, it was a race of white giants. How is a Native American greeting used by many tribes, such as the Sioux, the Tetons, the Dakota, the Omaha, and it was to see how many fingers you had on your hand? Well, here in Scripture, we read that the giants have six fingers. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, that had on every hand six fingers, on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he was also born to the giant. Now, First Chronicles chapter twenty verse six repeats this, uh, basically saying that the giant had six fingers uh, on his hands and his feet, uh, six toes on his feet, not fingers. Excuse me. So every one of these Native American rock drawings are located in the southwestern United States. You'll notice that every single one of these drawings depicts six digits on either the hands or the feet. Corey Daniel is a Native American historian that writes, The showing or shaking of hands came about to show that one was not of tainted bloodline. Five fingers proved that one did not possess the traits of bloodlust and violence which always accompanied the descendants or of the six-finger giants or men of renown. So there are dozens of articles uh, from the late 1800s, early 1900s, about giant bones, giant skeletons being found all across the United States, from the Northeast to the Southwest, in Tennessee, everywhere. And this is an article from 1882 uh, in which the New York Times talks about a giant skeleton found in the Red River Valley in Minnesota. Now, I found dozens of these articles, uh, but I'm not going to show you them all. I'll just show you this one. Um, in the early 20th century, the Smithsonian started collecting the remains, and now they are nowhere to be found. Uh, I spe it's speculated that the powers behind the Smithsonian knew that giants would dissuade uh, people uh, from believing in evolution, but it would confirm the Bible, so the Smithsonian started uh, removing these things. Um, we will study more about the Nephilim more deeply uh, in the next book, The Earth As It Was. Um, one story that we study in The Earth As It Was is the Lovelock Cave in Nevada, where eight, headed, eight, excuse me, eight feet tall red-headed giants are found. Well, that is backed up by... The, I uh, shouldn't have gotten into it, uh, an Indian princess uh, tells the story of her grandfather who says that they were, the giants lived in the mountains and the giants would come eat, grab people from the tribe and cannibalize them. And so they went to war with the giants and they eventually cornered the, the giants. They had red hair, six fingers. They cornered them in the cave in Nevada and put brush in front of the cave and burned the, the last of the giants after the war, lasted for three years. Well, what we find at Lovelock Cave, where the redhead skeletons were found, there were 42 skeletons found in Lovelock Cave, and eight or nine of them were eight-foot-tall giants, red hair. Um, what we find at Lovelock Cave at the entrance, you can go there today in Nevada, there are scorch marks, burn marks all over the cave entrance. So the story that we hear from the, I'm going to say the tribe wrong, the story that we find is synonymous with what we see at Red Lock, uh, Lovelock Cave in Nevada. All right, so we talked a little bit about the reshot structure, which I believe is the destroyed city of Atlantis. Um, people say that the city of Atlantis is a myth. Well, people also said that the city of Troy was a myth and until 1871 when Heinrich Schliemann found Troy. Now, Troy does appear in the Bible. It's Troas. It's where Paul leaves uh, some books and some clothes. And in the Bible, he tells Timothy to, uh, to bring his clothes and his books from Troas. Um, so we do find Troy in the Bible. And people said Troy was a myth uh, until we found it. And also, if you are Christian and you believe the Bible, you know uh, that Troas is there. Um, so many fascinating things in the book. Um, we can't fit it all into a slide. This right here is a map from Herodotus. This is uh, northern Africa. Down there at the bottom is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but if you look over there on the very west side of Africa, what do you see? You see the word Atlantis with a question mark. Well, what do we find in northwest Africa? Right there, where on his map it said Atlantis. The reshot structure. So um, we get into it in the book. Fascinating. I do think that this is the destroyed city of Atlantis, and it's not a lost city. 
Um, we get into all kinds of things in the book. Uh, here we have the ziggurat. This is a reconstructed ziggurat. This is not original, um, but this is at our um, fascinating stuff. Uh, this right here is a fascinating story from early Christian church. This right here was St. Christopher. St. Christopher was a dog-headed giant man. Really quickly, the story of St. Christopher, um, he was, he, when he was born in his life, he wanted to serve the most powerful being in the world. So he eventually found the local king, started serving the local king in his army. Well, that king was de, um, defeated by a devil-worshipping king. So um, St. Christopher started uh, following the devil-worshipping king. And the devil-worshipping king was a very evil man. And he would take uh, Jews, excuse me, not Christians, we're not there yet. He would take Jews and he would behead them. But the Jews would always pray uh, before they were killed. And St. Christopher saw the bravery of these Jews. And they heard these Jews praying to this God, Yahweh. And so St. Christopher said, well, this demonic king is not the most powerful being in the universe. I want to find this Yahweh. St. Christopher looks and he finds a, a temple um, and some rabbis, and the rabbis tell St. Christopher, he said, St. Christopher says, you know, I want to serve Yahweh, and the, the rabbis say, well, you are Nephilim, you cannot be saved. You cannot uh, go to heaven, but you can serve Yahweh. So St. Christopher agrees. They say, there's a river here, and people uh, need to get across the river. You're a giant, why don't you just carry people across the river? So for 40 years, St. Christopher carries people across the river to serve Yahweh, until one day a child uh, needs to come across, so St. Christopher carries the child, and with every step, St. Christopher gets heavier and heavier and heavier and almost drowns. But eventually St. Christopher reaches the other side, to which the child said, um, you have just carried the weight of the whole world on your shoulders. And it was baby Jesus that St. Christopher had carried across the river. Fascinating story from early Christian church, obviously not in the Bible, but uh, again, a story about a giant dog-headed man, um, if it's true, a Nephilim. <clears throat> also in the book, we study about the law code of Hammurabi. This is, uh, this is the law code of Hammurabi. It was the earliest form of uh, laws in the, in the uh, world and uh, recorded. It gave penalties and payments for all kinds of uh, malpractice and things like that. You'll find the law code of Hammurabi on the Supreme Court walls uh, here in the United States. So uh, packed a lot of stuff into the presentation. There's so much I want to talk about. Didn't cover it all. Again, it's in the book, Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them. My next book that I will start writing next month will be Secret Societies and uh, excited to get into that where we talk about the Illuminati uh, Knights Templar, uh, Rosen, Rosen uh, Krantz, all the different uh, things. The Bohemian Grove. How many of you folks ever heard of the Bohemian Grove? Bohemian Grove, fascinating out in California. Um, at the Bohemian Grove, they uh, at one of the ceremonies, I forgot the name of it, they wear robes, carry torches, and they burn a human effigy in the belly of Moloch, an owl statue, um, an effigy being a straw man. Well, the interesting thing about the Bohemian Grove is it's mostly Republican presidents from Ronald Reagan, uh, up to George Bush, they picked plenty of pictures of a more of a Republican uh, man's boys club, um, and it's just what goes on there is weird. So we get into that uh, in that study. Again, these are the social media uh, links. I have cards out uh, on my table with all these links, so you don't necessarily need to write this down. Um, but let's always remember, as we study the mysteries of the universe, I like to talk about a lot of strange things, mysteries of the universe, mysteries of the Bible. Let's not forget the focus, that Christ is the most important point of history, uh, the most important point in the Bible, and every one of us needs to come to know him as a savior. Now, I also speculate that Christ came for three reasons, not just to save mankind, and my, I'm most thankful for that, but he also came to reverse what happened at the Tower of Babel uh, when he separated the world into 70 nations. Notice he sends out 70 disciples back into the world, and when they speak, every language hears in his own language. Second thing Jesus came to do, and the third thing he, Jesus came to do was reverse the curse of the watchers, the curse of the Nephilim. Um, with the uh, reversing hormone. Michael Heiser does a great video on that. Um, so Jesus defeats the princes of the powers of the air, as we talked about a little bit. So Jesus came for three reasons, um, in my opinion. So as I leave you, um, let me give you a short, less than a minute video on what we're going to talk about tomorrow. The earth is not as it used to be. Can you hear that? There was a time when the Gagantis ruled mankind, when mighty Leviathan had dominion of the seas, and the hearts of men were evil. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. All right, 
So if you are able to make it tomorrow at 9.15, same time, I will be giving my presentation on the earth as it was. I just finished the book last week, and it should be printed next week. Fascinating study, so uh, come on out. And yes, in the Bible, Leviathan does have multiple heads. All right, Matthew.